Thanks, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be invited. Uh, it's wonderful science going on, and I think we all have a lot of reason to be optimistic. So hopefully at the, the end of my talk here, we'll um, you know, can be even more optimistic. So what we'll talk about today is considerations in gene and cell therapy manufacturing with uh, pathways to personalized medicine. So a little bit about Aldevron. Aldevron supplies critical reagents to pharmaceutical and biotech companies, specifically plasma DNA, proteins, and antibodies. So we really try to partner with um, our clients to deliver what they need to really enable them um, and to give them the basis for breakthroughs in their research and product development. So a little bit of overview of uh, what I'll talk about today. A um, little bit about just what is gene and cell therapy um, and why is the distinction between manufacturing and development um, blurred? What are some of the production challenges and uh, some new approaches? And lastly, what does the future hold? Again, hopefully we can just all be very optimistic about the advances going on in the field. So, if we go to the source of all human knowledge, Wikipedia, um, uh, we, it's a good place to start. So, uh, we define gene therapy as this therapeutic delivery of nucleic acid polymers into a patient's cells as a drug to treat disease. And cell therapy is a therapy in which cellular material is injected into a patient, and I think that's a those are pretty good places to start. Although even now, um, as Sean alluded to, we have um, allogenic cell therapy. So even this isn't exactly right because we can have gene therapy that is delivering uh, someone else's uh, cells into the patient to, as a drug to treat disease. So even uh, Wikipedia gets behind sometimes. So what are some of the disease targets that we can go after with uh, gene and cell therapy? Well, there's a lot of them, and I've tried to put up just a few here to describe um, diseases that are re related to aging and, and regenerative medicine. Um, obviously, we have ALS, um, cancer, uh, Parkinson's disease. There was a company, Neurologix, that pursued that. Uh, they're no longer around, but they made some uh, good progress on understanding how gene therapy could work in, work in that disease. Congestive heart failure, there was a company, Celadon, that pursued that. They're not around anymore either, um, but they've made a lot of advances in understanding um, how we might treat that disease. OTC, which is ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, was one of the first diseases to um, be treated with a gene therapy approach. Back in 99, there was an unfortunate death in a clinical trial there. Um, but we learned a lot from that and, and have sort of are emerging out the other side now as new things are developed. Talked a little bit yesterday about Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That's an active area. Uh, Age-related macular degeneration, certainly something that is relevant for regenerative medicine. Um, there was a company, Avalanche, which uh, emerged with another company now and had some challenges in, in looking at that disease as well, and we have cystic fibrosis and hemophilia. And I was thinking last night about, um, we were discussing that there needs to be more failure, right? That um, uh, we need to fund more speculative research and stuff, and I thought, well, if, if you're looking for a failure, then gene therapy is the right place as far as uh, some of these different programs. But that's, I think that's great because a lot of smart people spent a lot of work and people gave money and, and funding and whatnot to look at these things. And we need to continue to do that because that's the only way we're going to make progress. So let's talk a little bit about uh, direct delivery and cell-based delivery. You've seen variations on this slide uh, elsewhere, so I'll be, be quick about it. We, in both cases, we have some therapeutic gene um, and we're going to make some vector. And in the case of direct delivery, we're going to deliver that directly to an organ, could be various routes of administration here. Um, in other cases, and this shows adult stem cells, but they can be, as you've seen, T cells or, or other types of cells. We're going to extract those from the patient. <clears throat> we're going to modify them with this virus, and then the genetically modified cells go back into the patient. So these are the, the two different paths we're going to talk about. So when you talk about direct gene, uh, direct gene therapy successes, um, 
talk about a unicure with lipoprotease lipase deficiency, um, that's one of the only two gene therapy drugs on the market now. Um, Spark is making some real progress with inherited retinal diseases. Um, Biomarin is uh, making real progress with uh, their hemophilia drug. Um, and GSK with Stromvelis, the second gene therapy drug, this actually should be on the cell-based therapy slide, um, but they're making a lot of success here too. So I think that the key here is there's a lot of interest in the field and there, there's a lot of progress being made. If you look at cell-based therapy success, so although it's not gene therapy, Dendrion with their Provenge made uh, a lot of lives better by treating prostate cancer. Um, Bluebird Bio is making a lot of progress with their LentTD and other programs. And of course, we talked about Juno, Juno with their ALL um, program. And I think what this is telling us is that there's um, a good problem to have and that we're facing these biomanufacturing problems because we're seeing a lot of success in the field. So we talked a little bit yesterday about the costs and some of the challenges. And when we think about um, biomanufacturing, you know, these are one of the things that you want to help address. So in the Strombellis case, they just announced that the cost will be about $665,000. Now, you do get a money-back guarantee with that, but that's still quite a bit of money. Um, with Unicure, it's Glybera came out at $1.1 million, and a few months ago, they also announced that they weren't going to pursue this uh, in the U.S. They weren't going to go for FDA approval in the U.S. So, you know, these are challenges that you face when you have these very expensive therapies. And then as I was listening to Deb Miller last night talk about Duchenne's, um, you know, what, what would the Duchenne muscular dystrophy treatment cost? Because in this case, you need a lot more viral vector than you do with either of these cases. So, so that's going to be very expensive too. So these are some of the things that we need to address. <clears throat> So as an example of direct delivery, um, we have here the, the method by which we're trying to treat inherited blindness. So what happens here is we have um, the insertion of a needle into the eye, and <clears throat> usually there's a light probe to help guide the needle. And then the new gene in this viral vector enters the cells, and then the cells produce enzymes that are designed to treat some disease here. So this is the, the direct delivery method. So if you look at the products for the direct, direct delivery, how do we get uh, what we need to treat these diseases? One of the key, the key element is the viral vector. And the way that's produced is with plasma DNA, and there's actually can be three or four different plasmids for the production of a given viral vector. And live cell factories, so either 293 or HeLa or other cells here that combine now to produce the viral vector. And this is the material that we provide to our clients, and we spend a lot of time working with them to you know, develop the high-quality reagents so that they can produce these vectors. And if you look at um, cell-based delivery for cancer, uh, we've seen this uh, slide previously, but we're taking cells from a patient, then this ex vivo cell processing, we use a vector to transduce them, and then proliferation, and then readministration back into the patient. And this example is with the anti CD19 cells. But again, we've got this viral vector here, so this is sort of the common element between these two approaches. And again, we have the same methods of producing this viral vector. So when you look at this you know, complicated process of administering these gene therapies, you know, the question can be, what is the product from a quality perspective? So if we follow the green path, clearly the viral vector is the product because that's delivered directly to the patient. In the case of something with T cell therapy, uh, Certainly the T cell is the product. Um, the viral vector is close to the product, and, and these two components are even further away from the actual product. So given that live cell factories, you know, with 293 cells, they have a history, and you have to be very careful with um, the production methods and such, uh, it's pretty well accepted that these need to be produced at a GMP level. 
Um, but the question is, you know, can we look at these other components that go into a viral vector, namely the plasma DNA, and look at different quality levels for different applications in order to essentially identify opportunities to re reduce cost and timeline? So one of the things that we've developed at Aldevron is this concept of GMP source. So GMP source has a lot of the elements of full GMP manufacturing. Uh, there's environmental control, segregated manufacturing, rigorous QA, QC assays. But there are aspects of GMP, uh, environmental monitoring, primary and secondary operators, customized batch records that aren't part of GMP source because in some cases, GMP source is sufficient to provide a high quality product for some of these processes, especially in early clinical trials. The other thing that we provide for our clients is a consistent manufacturing from research through clinical. So the blue um, arrows here show our research grade service, which is the process by which we make plasma DNA. So we have growth, lysis, purification, and QC testing. These other service levels, GMP source, we have cell banking and screening, we have quality review, manufacturing reports, and then with GMP service, we have more process control here, client-specific back records and development work, but what we provide clients with is a consistent manufacturing process, so as they go from early research um, through early clinical trials and even through to commercialization, they can at least rely on the fact that the plasma DNA is going to be produced in a consistent manner. So some of the challenges that we face in providing these materials to our clients are scalability and capacity. And this goes for plasma DNA and viral vectors as well. Prior to Aldevron, I worked at a gene therapy company, Regenex Bio, uh, working on uh, viral vectors. So with plasma DNA, we're looking at a variety of different options, you know, that provided by groups like Thermo Fisher and, and whatnot to scale and add capacity. So we're looking to move to larger single-use fermenters. Um, we're exploring new methods like continuous fed batch fermentation, which is, which is not necessarily uh, initially something you would do with E. coli, but, but that's something we can take a look at. And we're looking at optimizing cell lines and conditions so that we can make a better product here for less money and, and more quickly. On the viral vector side, there's a variety of groups out looking at highly scalable methods, including um, baculovirus and SF9 cells. A lot of the early work in viral vector production is based on um, adherent cells, 293, and there are groups looking at suspension adapting these cells to have a more robust and scalable manufacturing process. We're also looking at packaging and producer cell lines. Again, we can do those in a bioreactor and make the whole process more scalable. And in cases where we want to keep with adherent cells, there are a lot of groups out there looking at hollow fiber and microcarrier bioreactors to again get this surface more dense packed in, in a given volume so that we can scale the manufacturing process with adherent cells. Another area is uh, quality control. So this is something we're, we're very concerned about, and I wanted to highlight just a few of the areas that we're, um, we work in that we partner with our clients to make sure that we're delivering quality materials that are going to be used in their products so that they can rely on um, what it is we're delivering. So one is homogeneity. So when you look at some of these assays, you're not looking at just the specification. In the case of homogeneity, you need highly, uh, high percentage of supercoiled plasmid DNA to get good transfection, but even the assays to do that. As these plasmids get larger, it becomes more difficult to, to do some of these assays. So there are groups out there and companies looking at um, HPLC and other different ways of doing um, AGE to determine homogeneity. And endotoxins, we're looking at faster and less expensive ways to do some of that testing. And of course, purity, we're always concerned about um, 
genomic DNA and other proteins in the plasma DNA preparations. Also, in the case of viral vectors, we're looking for purity, um, potency. We're looking to reduce empty viral capsids. Sometimes these capsids don't have DNA in them, so they're not effective. Looking at adventitious agents and consistent production with different methods. It's sometimes the case in biotherapeutics uh, that the process is the product. So how do we look at different manufacturing methods and compare them and understand what the differences are? Another area that's uh, an active <clears throat> research uh, within the field is minicircle DNA and nanoplasmids. So here's a case where you have DNA and you're going right into the cell that you want to transform, maybe through electroporation or something else, and you avoid the viral vector altogether. So in the case of minicircle DNA, the advantages are um, we don't have any antibiotic or bacterial sequences we get more efficient gene transfer um, when we avoid the viral vector, so that reduced cost of goods and time to, to market. Some of the challenges are less efficient production. Um, you need a specialized bacteria strain, and sometimes it's difficult to separate the parental plasmid from the minicircle itself. So you can hardly pick up a... Uh, journal or a trade publication and not uh, hear more about CRISPR-Cas9. So as opposed to the, the viral vector side of things, um, we also produce proteins for our clients and enzymes, including uh, Cas9. So briefly, with, with CRISPR-Cas9, we have the ability to cut specific DNA sequences with this guide RNA, and then by applying a donor, NR, donor DNA, facilitate repair, so we've delivered this new sequence to um, the, the gene. So th there's a couple companies, uh, CRISPR and Intellia, among others, that are pursuing this. And some of the challenges here are very similar to some of the challenges that we're helping our clients with on the plasma DNA side. So how do you deliver the Cas9? There's, uh, you can deliver it via protein, via the DNA, mRNA, and some people are even using viral vectors as the delivery mechanism for Cas9. There's Cas9 variants out there for specific tissue targets. So what Cas9 is um, appropriate for a given tissue? And what are the off-targets effects? And how can you, through the way you manufacture Cas9 or design it, reduce those off-target effects? Another area is messenger RNA, which has uh, gotten a lot of press recently with companies like Moderna and PhaseRx, basically in the process of <clears throat> transcribing DNA into mRNA and then translation into protein, let's say, okay, we'll use mRNA as the drug here. And the advantage is here, you get dose-dependent expression. Um, there are previously undruggable pathways that you can approach with this method. And very fast development. So one of the um, strategies of these companies is to be able to create these new therapies um, and get them to the clinic and then commercialize them very quickly. Some of the challenges which these companies have developed their own special sauce around is immunogenicity. Um, the expression is transient, so you have to continually administer the drug. It does require a linear DNA template for manufacture, so that's another key component that we're working with clients to manufacture at a high quality and an appropriate level for their use as they go through their development of, of the mRNA. And it requires several enzymes for manufacture, and this is another case where we're working with clients to produce those enzymes at the appropriate quality level so that the cost and timeline is appropriate for their development pathway. So coming up here, you know, we're really talking about sort of personalized medicine and how this biomanufacturing process is going to work. And with personalization, you're really talking about options, right? If you go to Dell's website, uh, you know, you can pick every aspect of your computer, the hard drive size, all of these different things, and that's because it's your own personal computer and you want what you want. And in the case of medicine, you have a unique genome, maybe your cancer has a unique uh, phenotype, and you need a product 
that's going to be for you, so you need options. But with options come complexity. And it's just now that we're getting the tools um, and the expertise to figure out this complexity and really design some of these treatments for individuals. So I was a little uh, unnerved to hear that this is being recorded because I'm going to make uh, predictions about the future and, and somebody's going to play it at some point and, and see if I'm right or not, but, but here goes nothing. Um, so if, you have a, if you're patient, we're going to identify the gene sequence that we want to deliver, um, find the delivery target. Is it a tissue? Is it the brain? Is it, can we just administer it intravenously? And what is your immune state? Because, again, if we use viral vectors for direct delivery, um, say, to your liver or something like that, if you have pre-existing immunity to that vector, that's a problem. It's not going to work for you. So a little shameless self-promotion of uh, the logo here on these uh, vials, but um, once you've identified the sequence and the immune state and the delivery tar target, can you essentially assemble these Lego pieces for a cure? So, you know, you, you can almost imagine like a huge factory, right, where you've got all of this automation, you have the information from the patient, all that comes into the factory, and the factory then pulls from each of these different um, categories the appropriate gene sequences, the appropriate plasmids, puts them together, and what you get out is a truly personalized therapy. So what's the ultimate goal? So we could have, you know, a hundred, maybe even thousands of gene targets that we've identified. And we have different delivery methods. There's a variety of viral vectors, new ones being invented and discovered every day. Um, other methods like Cas9 and the mRNAs and things like that, a variety of ways of delivering. So we have a matrix of options for personalized treatment. So there's this you could be 10,000, 100,000 different options here. So with all these delivery methods, and let's just focus a minute on the, um, the viral vector piece. <clears throat> Say you've got 10 different viral vectors, all of which have been part of a clinical trial of some sort to treat some disease with gene therapy. And you've got a set of genes that have gone into some viral vector and shown to be efficacious and, and provide... Um, uh, benefit to the patient. But what you want to do is combine one of those genes with one of those viral vectors that's never been combined before. So you've created a drug that has never been tested on an animal, never been into a human before. But can we manufacture things well enough and do we understand each part well enough that we can say, yes, we can give that to someone to treat their disease? And that's really the ultimate goal of all this, is, is creating drugs which didn't necessarily exist before you showed up with your disease, but now they're designed for you. And some of these biomanufacturing problems that we've discussed and, and we'll, we've discussed previously at the meeting are, need to be solved in order for us to get to this point in, in development. And at the end, um, for us at Aldevron, it's all about our clients' clients. So we provide, like I said, these um, services to our clients who then go out and, and create transformative therapies with severe unmet needs for people like what we see here. So Corey is, oh, Corey is uh, a young man in, I think, about 2008, 2009. Nine received one of the first ocular gene therapies for uh, a disease called Leeward congenital amaurosis. He was, you know, for all intents and purposes, blind, couldn't walk through a, uh, a maze, and um, a year later, he finished his first season of Little League. Um, it's a very heartwarming story. Emily was one of the first recipients of immunotherapy for cancer, part of the Carl June trials, and now she's four years cancer-free. Um, she had essentially weeks to months to live when she participated in the trial. So what we need ultimately is more pictures like this. So I appreciate your time and appreciate the opportunity to speak.